So, hi guys, I'm Raghav, and in this video, we will discuss about all the four problems of the lead code contest. This is the very first problem of the contest. We have been given two integer arrays of length n and m, and we have to find out uh, all the like total number of good pairs where a pair i comma j is good if nums i nums one i is divisible by nums two j into k, and this integer k will be given to us. So let me just explain the problem on one note. So okay, so the problem says like we will be given an array nums one and an array nums two, and we will have to find out all the good pairs i comma j, and we will be given an integer k as well, and a pair i comma j is good if Nums one i divisible by like if this thing is coming up to be zero, basically nums j is multiplied with k, and then if it is a divisor of nums of i, then the pair i comma j is good, and we have to find out the total number of divisors. Okay, so I hope that the problem is clear. Uh, just one minute, I'm coming. Uh, sorry, I'm back. Okay, so uh, like the problem is pretty simple. What you can do is, uh, uh, since the constraints here, like since the constraints here are very small, n is less than fifty and m is less than fifty. So all we can, all we need to do is, like just iterate over this array. Let's say you are running up a for loop of i, and inside it, iterate over the array uh, nums two. Let's say you are having the iterator like. Uh, you are having a for loop of j then for every i comma j pair you can just simply check if uh, this condition here is satisfied or not so that's all we need to do and that's how i pulled it up first of all i'm finding out the n1 and n2 the sizes of the arrays then i'm having two for loops of i comma j so that i will figure out all the pairs i comma j and then for each and every pair, I'm having this condition that if nums of i is divisible by nums of j into k, then answer plus plus. And at last, I'm returning the answer. So um, the time complexity here will be just big of n. We are having a simple, for, sorry, big of n square. We are having two for loops. And the space complexity will be big of n because we have been using just some constraint space. So I hope that this problem is clear. Let's move on to the second problem. String compression three. Okay, so this problem says that we will be given a string word and we have to compress it uh, using the following algorithm. That is begin with any, uh, begin with an empty string comp and then as long as the word is not empty, we have to do the following operations. Remove the maximum length of a of a, a prefix word made of single character C repeating at most nine times, and then we have to append the letter length of the prefix followed by the character to count. Okay, let me just explain it here. The problem statement might not be really clear. Let's take this example. You are having A coming up a lot of times. And then you are having B coming up two times. So here A is coming up 14 number of times. Now, what the problem says is, like if this is a word right now, in this word, look at the prefix. And as long as the prefix is having all the characters same, basically this first character is coming up uh, again and again. 
as long as it, it is happening just take up uh, the complete prefix as much as big prefix as you can of length uh, like length less than equal to nil maybe not so clear even now let's take one example here if you are having something like a a a a b b b in this kind of a case the biggest prefix you can take which is co consisting of only like the first character repeating again and again is this one right this is the longest prefix where only the first character is coming up again and again and we have been told that the length should be less than like less than equal to 9 of the prefix we take so if a was coming up maybe 100 times we can take only a nine of those characters like we can pick up only those nine of like only nine of those characters and then what we have to do is remove these characters from the word and in your comp string basically it's a compressed string we will up, uh, like we will write five comma like five in no comma just right five and a right so uh, that's what we have to do and it makes sense instead of writing a five times if you are writing five a and if you are eventually gonna be able to decode that five a is representing five a is coming up together so writing string like this is actually making uh, your code more memory efficient because you will require less memory here for storing the string. Okay, so I think that's all we have to do. Um, yeah, yes, exactly. So let me take one more example where A is coming up too many times. Maybe A, 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 A. Um, So here A is coming up 14 times and let's say B is coming two times. Basically, this is the example given in the problem itself. So here, the longest prefix which contains only the first character is this one. But its length is 14 and uh, we have been told that the prefix we can choose should have length less than equal to 9. So the longest prefix which we can choose right now is... I think this much. We are having nine elements here. After that, what we will do is we will just take out all of these nine elements out of the word. And then this remaining will be the, uh, like this remaining string will be the uh, new value of our word. Then we will do the exact same thing once again. We will try to find out the longest prefix we can find, which contains only the same character. And do the exact same thing with this guy as well. After this, we will have this is the remaining string, which is gonna be taken out, taken out in one go. Okay, so first of all, we chose nine times a, then we chose five times a, then we chose two times b, and that's our answer. Nine a five a two b. Nine a five a two b. Exactly. So for coding it up, the way I did it is I used one pointer, like I placed one of my pointers at this place. I placed my one pointer at this place. And for the other pointer, J, I actually did run a while loop that as long as um, the character on the jth index, let's say if my J is here, the character on the jth index is equal to the character on the ith index. I will just increment it. So there are three things. Uh, like first of all, uh, you are having a for loop of i, obviously. For every iteration of i, you are saying j equal to i, like you are initializing a variable j. Then you are saying that while um, word of i equal to equal to word of j as long as this is happening um, you will just increment j 
right we will just increment j this is the first thing for finding out the longest prefix right but you have to make sure two more things the one one of them is since j is being incremented again and again at some point of time j might become equal to n let's say if the array was a then i will be here j will initially be here then it will be here and then it will be equal to the size of the array like j will be equal to n and word of j will give you an error so this is why it is a good idea to just write up the while like in the while condition you should have j is less than n as another condition here and the next thing is you cannot have the length of the prefix being greater than 9 so you need to have one more condition j should be less than i plus 9 when j will be equal to 9 you would have already got a prefix of length 9 so you would have to just stop the while loop attack please so i hope it is clear now the visualization will look like this where i uh, variable will be at some place and then j will just increase like one by one as long as it finds the same character and if let's say the characters were here a a a and at some point of time it let's say found b so here you will get that word i is not equal to word j so uh, your while loop will be bro uh, broken here now you would know that j would have been incremented from i as many times as you have as you would have got these characters so j minus i is the number of times you uh, got the same character again and again so you can just like j minus i is a number you can make it a character like in the string we will have to push the character 5 not integer 5 so you can just say something like character 0 plus 5 so basically we can say something like j minus i this is the length of the string and add character 0 to it and then just type cast it back to character when you do this operation both of these will be converted to integers but uh, you can just type cast it to correct this like this so uh, this is the character you would have like you would have got the character in this way you can just increment it to your answer string or if you are calling it as comp after this what you need to oh just one second great i've I just wondered if I had started. I have started to record or not. And after this, all you need to do is just um, add up the word of i, the word which has occurred this many times. And after that, now your i, like since you have, like in my code, I used for loop for i. So I know that after the like after the end of this iteration. this i will be incremented and you know that you don't want your i to be anywhere here you want that this will be your remaining string so your i will i should become equal to j hai na what you want is for the next iteration i should be equal to j and since in the for loop i have already written i plus plus that's why i in like reinitialized with my i with i equal to j minus 1 so that Uh, after the end of this iteration my value of i will become equal to j minus 1 that is this place and i will be incremented like in my code i will show you uh, i wrote a for loop when i am having i plus plus as the increment like increment every time so i know that i plus plus will happen that's why i am saying that i equal to j minus 1 so that i will come up here and then i plus plus will make it come here for the next iteration so this will be the remaining string for the next iteration and like in case if the way i have written these two pointer thing if it looks complicated don't worry about it there are a lot of different people writing different uh, writing this thing in different ways and you can yourself write it in any way you want i just showed you the way i prefer to write uh, the two pointers approach so it looks like this and n string have been initialized and after that 
sorry. Yep. So I am going on for each and every character, ah, uh, one by one, and like every time I am just having these two pointer thing to find out the first in like first character which is not equal to the current character. J will stop at that place, or it will go out of the the bound. Basically, J minus one will be the last character which you can take in your prefix. Then answer plus equal to character of J minus I plus O to get the number of times you have got the same character coming up again and again. And then answer plus equal to word I to uh, add this A because you know like in the pattern you would have to add five and then A as well. And after that, I'm having i equal to j minus one because I want my i to end up at this place after, like, in the next iteration. So since j is here right now, I'm saying i equal to j minus one to come to this place, and i will be incremented, so it will come up here after incrementation. Here is I'm having the increment. So if I'm not having this line, in that case, saying i equal to j will make sense. In this case, it will make sense to have i equal to j, but uh, this is the way I prefer to write the code. Because sometimes I do have continuous statements that if, uh, like if if there is some condition, then continue. So I don't want to write that i plus plus thing in this if condition while continuing. That's why I prefer to keep it here. And at the end, I'm just returning the answer. So I think that the problem should be clear. The way I have written the code might not be very simple to understand for uh, some of you. Like it might look a bit confusing. Uh, you don't really need to worry about it. You can just write it in any way. There can be a different way as well, where you are just like where you just iterate over the array. And let's say if your i is at this place, you just keep track of the Index where you had got the first occurrence of a so far, or the last time when you had um like splitted the string maybe, you know like this kind of uh like these lines wherever these lines are coming, you could have kept track of that index, and you could have written some if else conditions which will be similar to um this and this, and on the basis of that you could have. Uh, implemented it. So for now, let's move on to the next problem. Problem C. Find the number of good pairs. Two. So this is a follow-up problem for the first problem which we did in the contest, uh, like in the editorial right now. In this problem, uh, the only difference is that the constraints are pretty huge now. Now, like this is the follow up for problem one. And here, what we have been given is n is less than or equal to 1e5, e and um, like m is also, since we have been given the arrays with names nums1 and nums2. I would like to give the names like the lengths of the arrays as n1 and n2. The problem referred to them as m, like n and m. But for now, I will just refer to them with n1 and n2. So n1 and n2 can be pretty huge. Earlier, the time complexity or of, of our approach was n1 into n2. It will not work out here. Secondly, the elements of the arrays. Um, nums1 of i or nums2 of i, these will be as large as 26. I don't remember what was the limit on them earlier, but right now, what was the sound? Okay, so now the constraints will be like these. 
Uh, by the way, there is a prerequisite I will give to you. This is not really that important to know about it for solving the problem, but it will be good if you study about sieve first. Like sieve is a standard thing. It will be useful for you in a lot of problems. And like in sieve, uh, for now, like for solving this problem, you don't need to learn sieve. I'm just recommending uh, like this is a recommendation from my end that you should uh, explore sieve as well. It will be very similar to what we do here in terms of time complexity analysis. So like in sieve, it goes like you're having integers in the range from 1 to n. And you want to figure out which elements are prime and which are not. I won't really discuss about the sieve properly. Uh, the main thing which I want to share is we write up we write up the code in some way like this one int i equal to two less than equal to n i plus plus and then inside it we have a loop of j starting from i or i plus i like it depends upon the way you are writing sieve. So there are different variations, just like depending upon the thing which you have to do with sieve. So let's say if it is having something like, or maybe just leave it. What I want you to know is, if you are having something like for int i equal to one, i is less than equal to n, i plus plus. For int j equal to i, j is less than equal to n, and j plus equal to i. If you are having two for loops like these, and you are having let's say some loop of one operation here, then the overall time complexity of these two for loops will come up to be because of n log n. The reason is for the first iteration of i, we are having n iterations of j. For the second iteration of i, since you will be having jumps of 2 to this time, there will be n by 2 iterations. On the third time, when i will be equal to 3, you will have jump, you will have jumps of 3, 3. So the time complexity will be n by 3 and so on. So um, in general, like if you try to find out the time complexity, you can see that the very first element is 1, sorry, the very first element is n. The sum of these two will be less than n. The sum of the next four will be less than n. Right, because like this n by 3 is less than n by 2 and n by 2 plus n by 2 will be n. So this whole thing will be less than n by less than n. Similarly, all of these are less than n by 4 and summing up 4 times n by 4 will be nothing but n. So these 4 would also be less than n. And if you just pair up the first, like the first guy, the 2 next, the 4 next, and so on. So you will have around log n number of pairs, everyone having time complexity less than n. So the time overall time complexity will be less than n log n. Um, I just gave a small proof here and in case if you have any confusions here, like you can just go up for sieve, uh, wherever, from wherever you learn about sieve, that person will definitely teach you about the complexity analysis and there will be a lot more things you will study there, which is very good to know. For now, I'm assuming that everyone who's, who's coming up here has either understood the time complexity like this. Or in case if you did not understand, then maybe just redirect to a different problem where you will learn something standard, which will be useful here. Okay, so now let's come up to the problem. Right now, what we discussed here is not related to problem. Like this is not related to the current problem mainly. This is a standard thing. Which you should definitely know. This might come up to be very useful for you in future. So now let's come up to the problem, main problem. 
we have two arrays nums1 nums2 sizes of them are n1 and n2 and we have to find out the number of pairs i comma j where this condition is satisfied now the very first thing i can definitely see here is this k will be used only once in saying nums2 j into k there is no other use of this k so why don't i just multiply each and every variable of nums2 by k like why don't i just initially multiply it with k every time and now in that case like if i do this then the problem will be simplified to finding out all the pairs i comma j where nums1 nums1 i um is divisible by nums 2j this will be the new problem for us and here uh, the limit like nums 1 divisible nums 1 will be less than equal to 1 e6 the uh, elements of nums2 can be greater than 1 e6 like the elements of nums2 can be up to 1 e9 because they could have been up to 1 e6 earlier and k could have been up to 1 e3 so in the maximum case it can be this much only and like there is one very obvious thing here if nums2 is greater than 1 e6 then it can never be a div uh, like divisor of any of the nums 1 right if nums 2 j is greater than 1 e6 then it is useless hai na so you can just ignore all the nums 2 j which are greater than 1 e6 since they have no use case they are just completely use, useless okay very well now what now i can just say that i am having only this as this as the problem both the arrays are having elements less than 1e6 if there is any element which is greater than 1e6 then it has no use case and i can't really solve it with the n1 n2 n2 time complexity even now uh but Uh, like since we don't really have a lot of options here for what we can do in my case like something like c was coming up in my mind if i could just like not exactly c um in but i actually got to learn about this thing when i learned about c that um if in range 1 to n let's say you are having elements from 1 to n and you want to find out the number of divisors of all the elements for every i you want to know about divisors of i in the range from 1 to n in that case what we used to do was uh we used to run up a for loop of i going up from 1 till n Uh, okay, draw capital M there, and then for every j from i less than equal to n, since I only care about the i in the range from till n, j plus equal to i, we could just increment the divisors of j by one. So basically, what we are doing here is. for all of these integers in the range from 1 to n we are going to all of their multiples in the range from 1 to n and we have been incrementing their counts basically that we have got this many divisors and this is something we could totally do i hope that i am not making any mistake here um, just in case if i got Uh, just in case if i missed something out here well, then please tell me about this in chat 
So, like as far as I know, it will come up to the loop of n log n time complexity because we are having a for loop of n size, and the inner for loop will be having the size equal to n by oh, wait. Um, the inner for loop is having the size n by i. Um, yeah, the inner for loop is having the size n by i. So it is nothing but the summation of n by i from one to n, which will turn out to be n log n. So right now the thing is, the problem is. Uh, oh, one one more thing which I want to point out. This is also something standard. Uh, what do I mean by standard? Is this is uh, a technique. Sort of a technique which a lot of people know about, and you will be able to use this thing a lot of times. Like there will be problems which are based on this technique itself, like this problem, which can be solved very easily if you knew knew about this thing. That if you have to figure out the number of divisors for all the elements in the range from one to n, you could do it like this. If you did not know about it, then the problem could have been a bit more complicated for you. So now, like if you had this knowledge. In that case, like in case if you did not have this knowledge, then you have it now. Take it. You just pause the video here, and you should try the problem on your own now. Uh, but let's say if you are not able to solve it even then, then watch the video. So now the thing is, we are having two arrays, nums one and nums two. You want to figure out for each and every element which is in the array nums one. How many divisors does this element has, and like you have to count only those divisors which are coming up in the nums two array. So one thing which looks very intuitive right now is uh, the outer loop for i which we had. You can just have like you can just run it for all the elements of the array nums two. So you can say something like for int i in nums two. Basically, this will take up each and every element uh, of nums to one by one in every iteration. And here you could just say, for int i in nums to, um, here you could just say that uh, go for all j equal to i, j is less than equal to n, j plus equal to i, and you would increment the divisors count. Of j there, you could very well do this, but there is one problem. In the C thing, the reason the time complexity was actually coming up to be big of n log n was because you were having the value of i being increasing like from one to n, है ना? Right. But here in this case, what if all the elements of the array nums two are equal to one? In that case, you would actually have a very bad time complexity. You will actually have this inner loop running up completely in like big of n time every time, right? We want to cure that problem, and for that, there is again this is also a standard optimization. What we do is, uh, for every index in nums, like for every element in nums two. For every element in nums two, we can find its frequency. We can find its frequency. Let's say that the frequency of i. Uh, maybe if you are having an array like M P. Where MP of i is telling you about the frequency of i in the array nums two, then in that case, let's say uh, basically all you need to do here is increment the number of divisors by MP of i. That's it. Um, the number of times this element i is coming up in the array, that many times this divisors of j would have been incremented. So you are just incrementing it. Right away by that amount, and we will go for this i only once now. Like for every element, for every i, you doesn't matter how many times it is coming in the array. 
like earlier what was happening is if you are having one coming up three times in the array then you you were having three complete for loops of one going up from j equal to 1 till n three times right and you were incrementing the value of divisors of j for now i'm writing it as if you were incrementing it three times differently so we have saved that time complexity by incrementing it by three once and not running the for loop more than once just run it once this is how we have uh, saved our time now the way you will manage that you run it only once it's not a difficult task it's up to you in what way you want like you if the maximum like it depends upon what can be the maximum value of the elements of the array um in case if it is not going to be too big which generally will happen you can just create a vector of int mp which we talked about of size mx plus 1 like whatever is the maximum size of the array generally this mx is supposed to be less than equal to 1e6 or 1e5 maybe 2e6 in the maximum case very rarely you will see it as 1e7 if you are uh solving a problem which is having only this part like it is not having anything else in the problem then so like in, in those cases you can just run up this outside loop as int i equal to 1 i less than equal to n i plus plus and just check here that in case if the map i basically the frequency of i is 0 then continue that's it so for every element you will just go one by one only or if you are a bit lazy then maybe you can consider using a map or a set though it's not really recommended because maps and sets are slow a lot slower than um, vectors so like if you are using map or set then maybe it actually depends upon the constraints if nums if the size of nums1 is very small then maybe using a map and set can be beneficial for you but if nums of 1 is having a very big size then uh, just using this vector like obviously you can have a different name uh, i am just naming it as np for now uh, in ca in case of the size is very big then using this can be beneficial okay so let me see if we have discussed the complete problem the very first thing which we did in the problem is we eliminated k from the problem for that we just said that nums of 2 i would be multiplied with k right away second thing which we did is um so yeah we ignored all the we ignored all the nums of 2 j greater than uh, 1e6 like whichever elements were having a value greater than 1e6 just ignore them because they are useless they will not be able to form any pair since all the elements in the nums one array will be smaller than them okay um now the third thing which we did here is i think we just ran up the c events directly like not c but uh, we did run, run up that for all i in range 1 till 16 like for every element um if i is coming up in like if map of i is greater than 0 basically if uh, the element i is coming up in nums of 2 at least once then we went up for uh, j equal to i basically for for all multiples for all multiples of i let's say the multiple as j for now uh, like the current multiple then we said that divisors of j will be incremented by map of i 
in my code instead of naming it as divisors i actually named it as count i think it would have been good if i had named this thing as count and this thing as divisors but um, okay i have already coded it whatever so now that's what we did we said that for every element i in the range from 1 to 26 if the element is coming up at least once in the map basically at least once in the array nums2 then we will go for all of its multiples i and increment their count basically increment the count of their divisors by the frequency of i in the array nums2 and then like uh, you have already got the number of divisors for each and every element um so now what you need to do is just go over a array like and i equal to one sorry zero i less than n i plus plus and you can just say answer plus equal to count of nums one for every element you know about the number of its devices which belong to the nums two array so now for each and every element which is belonging to the first array nums one you will just go up to all of its like all the elements of the nums one array and increment their count to the answer and then return answer that's it okay so i think that this step will not have any doubts this step will have no doubts um it will be very clear it will be clear and uh, what we are doing here should also be clear the only thing which we have not discussed so far is what will be the time complexity so see this for loop will run up exactly 26 times Anna, it will have 26 iterations this thing will have at most n1 iterations like uh, out of these 26 iterations um, there will be at most n1 iterations for which your code goes below like beyond this line since there are sorry n2 since there are at most n2 elements in the array uh, which is 25 at most so um yeah you can just say that there are at most n2 number of distinct elements in the array so your code will go at most n2 number of times beyond this line so uh, once it goes beyond this line for every element you are having um like this is big of one thing um and this for loop will have the size of um 26 by i so n2 times you are having 1e6 by i as the time complexity now in case if a single element i could have come up multiple times then this would have been very huge because it could have been just 1e6 again and again in every iteration but uh, fortunately we know that i will be distinct like there will be all the occurrences of i will be distinct so even if i is like the smallest n2 number of elements even in that case you will just have the like this part as the summation of uh, like right now the thing is it is not exactly n2 into 1e6 by i it is actually summation of 1e6 by i for i belonging to um nums to array mm -hmm. so in the worst case what can happen is i might be equal to uh, the smallest n2 number of elements in case if i is greater than this value will obviously reduce so the mm, summation would definitely be smaller the maximum possible case for your, your summation can be when i is having the smallest n2 elements and mm -hmm like from the proof which we had done earlier um, you can easily derive it that it will come up to be 1e6 log of n2 uh, times because we will be having 1e6 iterations first time then in the next two iterations next two iterations of i we will have total of 1e6 iterations for the inner loop and so on so there will be like log n num pairs of 1e6 total iterations 
and uh, like the time complexity now will come up to be equal to this 1e6 that is 1e6 plus the reason we are having a plus is because uh, not every time you are going up completely in Anna, you are not com going up completely in every time we are going inside only n two times and we have already seen uh, its multiple right so it will be 1e6 plus this thing that is 1e6 log of n2 so we can just ignore this for now so the time complexity should come up to be 1e6 log n2 overall for uh, these for loops and like i think that i have not made any mistake right now in terms like in finding the time complexity but there's a but there's very well a good chance of me making some mistake in case if i have made some mistake then please correct me in the comment section uh, but mota mota the time complexity will come up to be something like this in case if we had used vector uh, like maps instead of vectors for this count value thing and this map then the time complexity could have been significantly worse like it could have got a complete log and log into extra time which like 1e6 into log of n2 will easily pass but 1e6 into log of n2 into log of n2 is likely gonna fail it will likely gonna like it will likely fail because um, log of n2 will be something like 20 probably since n2 will be at most 1e5 log of n2 will most probably be like 20 in the worst case so 1e6 into 20 will be something like 2e7 iterations for this for loop but if you use a map or a set which is having extra log n factor then in the worst case the time complexity will have another 20 in the multiplication so it will go up to as 4e8 which will definitely fail like most probably it should fail it should fail okay and we have done some more stuff like multiplying the elements and ignoring these elements um these can be done in linear time complexity so we can just ignore it like it will have at most into time complexity here for ignoring these people you are just not doing some stuff in some iterations like you're just ignoring these people so it can be done by just writing some if uh, the value is greater than 1e6 then continue just um this kind of stuff so it will also like not take any extra time this uh, you can just avoid spending any extra time on this or you can just have uh, like it's simple uh, i don't think we should say anything for this time complexity basically whenever you find out nums of j to be greater than 26 then whatever thing which you were about to do just don't do it so you are having some complexity being saved here and this thing is having big o of n one time okay so let's see the code now um we are having uh yeah by the way since i was going to declare a map sorry an array of size 1e6 and i knew that i will just create sorry hey yeah, these arrays with size mx plus 1 and mx plus 1 basically 1e6 almost uh since i knew that i will create arrays of this much size i created them globally and uh, then initialize their values here so that like it makes your code a bit faster again and again creating those arrays inside the stru uh, struct will make the solution a bit slower and i don't really need this mx here since i have already declared it here uh, and to avoid writing 1e6 again and again you can just create a constant integer and um, first of all i am initializing the values of count and map after that I am saying that if the uh, value in x into k, basically the new value for nums of 2 is less than or equal to mx, only then increment its frequency in the uh, map array, frequency array, otherwise don't do anything. So 
we should have a capital M accent. After that, for every i in the range from 1 to mx, uh, like you obviously don't need to write it like this. Um, in case if the frequency is 0, then continue. In case if the frequency is not 0, then you are just going up to all of its multiples and you have been incrementing the count by the current frequency. And after that, you are just going up to each and every element in the uh, nums1 array. And whatever number of divisors they have, you are just summing up all of them and storing them inside a vector, like an a long, long integer answer. And you have been printing it here or returning it here. You could have very well created it inside the um, struct. And I think it should work like it should not get TLE, I think, but uh, it would be safe to just declare it globally because you are, you are willing to create a very big array. You know? So whenever you are creating a very big array, it's always recommended to just create it globally once. Otherwise, you will have to declare it again and again. And for that, uh, this much contiguous memory would have to be allocated to the array, which will become a slow process. It, it sometimes can uh, mess up your time complexity significantly. Not significantly, but uh, in case of tight complexities, it can affect. Okay, and we have already discussed the time complexity. Like, this part will take big O of mx time. This part will take big O of n2 time. This iteration is like just this for loop will go big O of mx times, and inside this, this thing will go like um, mx login. So overall, the time complexity of this approach will be um, mx of log n2, mx, uh, mx into log n2. And this thing will go in the go of n1 time. So the overall time complexity is coming up to be the go of n1 like yeah big of n1 plus mx log n2 and you are having plus n2 also this is the time complexity and space should be we are creating two global vectors global arrays and other than them we are not creating any other vectors or anything. So the space complexity will be straight away big O of mx. And maybe you can just say it as n1 plus n2 plus mx. If you want to count the space complexity of the given vectors also. In general, if we are talking about the auxiliary space, which we have created from our side for solving the problem, then it will be big O of mx time space. Okay, so let's move on to the fourth problem. Now for the fourth problem. The fourth problem says, you will be given an array, let's say nums. And you will be given a lot of queries. And in every query, you will be given some integer position and the value. So all you will have to do is um, in the nums array, say nums of pos equal to x. Basically update the element at the index pos at this index. Uh, update it with the value x and then you will have to print the score of like uh, you will have to calculate the score of the nums array like in the problem they did not define anything like score for the convenience of ex uh, for explanation 
I will be calling it as score of the array. So let's define the score of the array as maximum possible sum of any subsequence such that any like maximum possible sum of any subsequence such that uh, no two adjacent elements are picked up as an example if there is an array like 1 minus 1 7 8 1 Maybe let's have a two here. So in this kind of an example, the maximum possible sum you can gain through any subsequence is gonna be um, these three elements. You cannot pick up these two together. You cannot pick up these two together. Either you can pick up this one or this one. And like if you pick up this guy, then you cannot pick up this two also either. So I think you got the idea. You cannot pick up any two adjacent elements in the subsequence. Now, uh, like in case if the problem had only one query for solving the problem, let's just make the problem simple. Let's say if there was only one query and that query, let's say, did not do anything. Uh, it just replaced the nums of zero by whatever value it initially had let's say it just it just replaced it with zero whatever it did after that you will have an array now for calculating the score of nums you can solve it very easily with dynamic programming every time you will have two choices either pick this guy or don't pick this and you would require to like create a state like dp of n and um, last where this last variable can have only two choices like let's have it in this way you will create this many states dp of n means we are talking about the range from one till n for the first sorry zero till n minus one maybe basically we are talking about the first n elements and dp of n zero is representing that we have considered uh, this many elements and for the next element um, dp n zero means that you have not picked up the last phase so you can pick up the current element like the last element has not been picked and for dp of n1 it will just have the condition that it cannot be picked yeah you cannot be you cannot pick up the current element because you have picked up the last guy so in this kind of a way like the problem is solvable in big of n time for every query which will not work here i'm not really ex like i have not explained the complete approach for dynamic programming yet since it's not required for this problem, um, probably you will just find up an exact same problem on internet. If you just search for the exact same thing, that uh, maximum possible sum of any subsequent such that no adjacent elements are chosen. Probably you will find um, the exact same problem online. For now, the thing is, you can't solve the problem in big O of, uh, like you will have to solve the problem in big of n time complexity. And after calculating it once, if um, the value of nums of zero gets changed to maybe 10, you can't really find out the score in an efficient manner now. You will again have to run up big of n time complexity, because like you will have to again run up the exact same DP for big of n time to find out the score once again. 
basically what i want to say is if you use dp then updation is very costly whenever you update the elements you will have to again have a big of n time complexity uh, approach for finding out the new score so updation is costly we have to think of something else so since we have to figure out uh, like since we have to make updates in the array and we want to answer after every query it makes sense to at least think about segmentary ones um if you have some other intuition that maybe think about the other intuition first in case if you are not having any other intuition or if nothing is looking up to be working here then just because of the fact that we will have some updates maybe we should think about segment trees so if you try to build up a segment tree yeah, there is a prerequisite in this problem what i will suggest you to do is learn about dp and learn about segment trees um though dp is not applicable here like we will not be able to solve the problem with dynamic programming but it is a good thing to learn our motive for solving problem is problems is to learn about new things now so whenever you get some chance for learning something good which is standard i just always recommend it into this and you should definitely learn about segment trees since in our approach today we will be using segment trees so when we try to think about segment trees let's say that this is the root node from which you would like to know about the answer what information do we need we need to know about the maximum sum of any subarray with no two adjacent elements take okay. up whatever thing which we wrote earlier you just want to know about the exact same thing so if you store this thing in every node of a segment tree will you be able to merge the children like if this children if this child is actually having the information of let's say this is the complete tree and the left child is having information related to um, this much array and the right child is having this much array and in the root you want to have the information of the complete array so just knowing about the maximum possible sum of any subarray with no adjacent elements uh yeah the maximum possible sum of any sub subsequence um with no two adjacent elements in this subarray if you know about this thing and you know about the same thing for this subarray can you merge both of these nodes can you merge both of these arrays and gain the information for the root node which you need it's no obviously you cannot find it in this way you will have to do something else you will need to do something like you will need some different information the problem here is you don't know if this um segment actually included this guy or not and for this uh note whether this segment was including this guy or not if both of these include these two elements then merging them is not possible right so one thing which makes sense is in the notes you should keep track of the left and right as well whether the leftmost element and the rightmost elements have been chosen or not so in that way you will be able to know that let's say for the left note it says that you have chosen the rightmost guy and the right note says that you have not chosen the leftmost guy so it can be merged right in that case you can you can merge these notes you can merge these segments but there is one serious issue here there is one serious issue the problem is what if the left node says that it has chosen the rightmost guy for finding out like the maximum subarray the sub the maximum subsequent sum includes the rightmost guy and for this subarray as well it includes the leftmost guy for the maximum subsequent sum with no adjacent elements then in that case what will you do we can't really do anything right so we would need to store some more information and from here on i think it is not really difficult to see 
that maybe you can just have four different things in every node. The maximum possible subsequent sum, um, like you can have four different possibilities. Let's say val zero comma zero, which represents max possible sum of any subsequence where neither the neither the leftmost nor the rightmost guy is chosen. Right. You can have it in this. Like um, you can just create four different things in this way. Similarly, zero will, will have rightmost guy being chosen. One zero can have leftmost guy being chosen. And one one can have both people being chosen. So if you know about these four things for the uh, nodes, that in this subarray, what is the maximum possible sum of any subsequence such that the rightmost guy is chosen? Or if this guy is not chosen, and like if this guy is not chosen and this guy is chosen, or both of them are chosen, or none of them is chosen, then then let's say for the root note, root note, um, if you want to figure out the value of one comma one for the root note, then you can just call it as the maximum of, um, let's say that this is the root note, this is the left note, this is the right note. Obviously, you need to know what segmentary is properly here. If you don't have a good idea about segmentaries, then this might have been looking a bit complicated. Um, we gen like we do stuff like this very often. Not exactly in this way, but we do stuff like this quite often. Uh, we just try to think that for merging two nodes, what information do you require about this subarray and about this subarray? So, like in this case, since the causing problem could have been that rather these two people like what will be the maximum possible sum of the leftmost like the left guy if it had chosen the rightmost element or what will be the maximum sum of the left um, subarray subsequence if it had not chosen the left mo rightmost guy and similarly you had uh, some condition for the right note that what if you choose this guy and what if you don't choose this guy what will be the maximum answers since you need to worry about both the left and the right sides, like for this node, you need to know about the right guy. For this node, you need to know about the left guy. So obviously, you need you would have to take care of left and right both for both of the sides. So there will be four possible combinations, whether both of them are not chosen, or the leftmost and the rightmost guys are chosen, or the leftmost is chosen, or maybe the rightmost is chosen and the leftmost is not. You know, you will have these four combinations. So when you're merging the nodes left and right, the root val one comma one, which means that both the leftmost and the rightmost people should be chosen from the given vectors, sorry, from the given um, subarrays. Um, in the left side, you will, like since you are willing to know about this and this being chosen, you will have to consider a uh, val of one for the left guy, like for the left guy, uh, you cannot have it uh, not chosen here. Since we are willing to find out this val of one comma one here, obviously we will find out zero comma zero, zero comma one, and one comma zero as, as well. And now for the left vala subarray. There are two things which can happen with this guy. Either it will be chosen or it will not be chosen. Similarly, for the right, right guy, there can be two things. Either it will be chosen or it will not be chosen. In the case when both of these are chosen together, 
we will not consider that case because it is invalid we will consider all the other cases that left val dot zero basically left guy is not choosing the rightmost person and the right dot val zero comma one the right guy has also not chosen the leftmost element of its array of its range and similarly l val one comma one plus r dot val um zero comma one and l comma l dot val one zero plus r val one zero like we have uh, sorry one one we have considered all the possible three cases whatever comes up to be the maximum of these three will be stored inside the root of val one comma one and it's not just valid for one comma one it's actually true for all i comma j like for any i comma j you can just say like this um if you want you would have written it four times for the pairs 0 comma 0 or 0 1 1 0 and 1 1 you could have written it four times in this maximum value condition or you could just notice that if you are willing to find out the root dot val i comma j then you will only consider the places where the left most node of the leftmost guy is like l dot val where it should have an i if i was equal to zero then left most node of the leftmost guy should be zero else it should be one and like here whatever comes zero or one plus right val similarly here whatever comes and for the rightmost node of the rightmost guy it should be having j here parity j so like i think that the problem is very doable now we know how to merge the nodes um for the base case if you are having a node uh, like if in the array you are having elements one two three maybe let's say you are having elements one two three four then for the root nodes you can just say um like a root node which will only have information about this sorry not the root node leaf node leaf node as i spoke wrong uh, we are talking about the leaf node so for the leaf node which is having only which is having only one element in its range there is only one possibility like if you talk about val of 0 comma 0 obviously it should be 0 if you are not having any subsequence, then the um, sum of the subsequence will have zero. In case if you try to do something like zero comma one or one comma zero, this is not really valid. This is invalid. You cannot have the rightmost guy being chosen and the leftmost guy not chosen because if you are having a subarray of range of only one element, if you choose this guy in the subsequence, it will be both the leftmost and the rightmost guy. So. In the case when you talk about val of one comma one, it it will be equal to whatever value of the element is. In this case, it is four. For the cases where zero comma one and one comma zero, it would not work. Uh, like it is not really a valid thing. So I initialized it with zero, but I think like it worked when I initialized it with zero. But I think that you might consider initializing it with a very small value since we are willing to figure out the maximum values in future. So you can just initialize it with a very bad value as well. And luckily in my case, it worked up with zero comma zero also, like with zeros as well. Okay, and we know how to merge. For the case where a node is not having, like it is having an empty subarray. In that case, um, all of these will be zero. Like 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. This should obviously be 0. And these should be invalid things. So again, you can consider giving them very bad values, very bad negative values, or you can just give them zeros. Like it worked in this case, but uh, in general, I would prefer to give them a very small values, especially if I, if I was attempting this problem during a live contest. 
okay and for the updation part i think updation part is like really simple you will just have to change the value of the element you have there like operation is updation is simple mm, yep i think it's that's set of that's it so here is my code for the segmentary thing i am having a template of mine um in which i have like i don't need to make any changes inside this struct i just copy and paste it in from my templates and i have to make changes only inside this node array like node struct this is the information i want to store at every node this is what i will have for an empty range like when there is a node which is not having any like you i hope you remember that if you are having something like maybe if your array is having only uh, actually it depends upon the way you create arrays as well like in my case the segmentary i have created is iterative and like this is an iterative segmentary template um, feel free to use recursive as well it should also work and this is the information i'm storing for a note which is um keeping information of an empty subarray so in that case i have initialized all of them by zeros ideally it should have been initialized with something very bad but zero is also not affecting our answer so it's also fine there um and then if there is one node in the um like if there is a node which is having only one element in its range in the subarray then i will have val of 1 comma 1 as v and for merging two nodes i have been running two for loops for i and j and this is the same thing which we discussed earlier for merging to like for uh two ranges val of i comma j is having L dot val of i comma zero or r like zero zero area. Uh, we are having zero zero here, or we are having one zero, or we are having zero one. For updating a note, I'm just initializing a new note. Or what I could have done is, um, I could have just add val of one one as v. That's also fine. or you can just do this and for like this is one extra thing which i created since i don't want to write something like this inside my um main function where i will be uh, using the segmentary i created a function with name answer which will return me the actual information i require like in the node if you remember this is what you are storing in every node but this is not the thing which you need as the answer the answer was actually this maximum subarray sum sorry maximum subsequent sum where no two adjacent elements are chosen which will be equal to the maximum of these four so that's why i'm having this answer um vector sorry the answer function and here inside the main function like the function which i have to complete i am creating a segmentary and for every query i have been up making the update which i have to make and then with the sg dot query thing uh okay i could have actually created a function with name different name as well anyways it's fine so here what i will be doing is answer plus whatever answer comes up from this query and taking the mod with mod because i have to at last print answer with uh, mod 29 plus 7 and at last i'm just printing the answer so that's all we have to do for this problem um the time complexity here like if you know if you see for the nodes everything which we are doing is just having some constant time complexity like this is having big o of 4 time which is generally considered to be equivalent to big o of 1 similarly it is having big o of 1 space in this way this is also working in just big o of 1 time um obviously it is having around 10 like 4 it is having four iterations and the thing which we are doing here is 
equivalent to around four uh, statements. But in general, we will call it as big of one time. This is also big of one time. This is also big of one time. So in general, the node will take big of one time every time. So the segment tree. When we apply the build operation on the segment tree, it will take just big of n time for building it. And for every query, we are having around a login time from the segment tree. Like the update function will work in because of login, and this query function will also work in because of login time. And the other things are just because of one time. So overall time complexity is big of n plus um, q login. Big of n plus q login. That's the time complexity we have got here. And talking about the space on the segment tree, which I um, created there. It's taking big of two into one time, like we generally could just call it as big of n. And obviously, every node is actually having something like four, four variables in themselves. So it will have quite a lot of uh, constant factor, something like 10x, like more than 10 into n. Um, yeah, around more than 10 into n, or maybe 8 into 10 at the very least. It will have at least this much constant factor along with it. And I'm not creating any other um, vector or array from my own. So this will be the space and time. Um, yeah, the problem was on the easier side in terms of thinking about the logic and implementation. But in case if you did not know about segment trees, then the solution might have been looking a bit complicated to you. And I don't know if there is any simpler solution also possible. I looked at a few more people's solutions and they had used segment trees. So I thought that this is good enough. Um, and like, uh, yeah, one more thing. A few people in Java, a few people coding in Java, apparently they just solved the problem in big of and into Q time complexity, which should ideally give TLE, but it somehow passed because of weak test cases. So it was a bit unfair with us with the C++ people. So I hope that you got to learn about something new from the editorial. And in case if the video helped you out, then please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. And please give your feedback in the comment section. Thank you for watching the video and bye-bye.